following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah! Exploding down the sideline. This is Hanging with the Boys. Broadcasting live from Dallas Cowboys World Headquarters at the Star in Frisco. Now, your hosts, Nate Newton, Kurt Daniels, and Shannon Gross. Shannon Gross, hosting. Thankful Thursday. <laughs> oh, Thankful man. that the That's Cowboys the don't have a losing record. <laughs> Thankful for the victory Sunday. Thankful for the gumbo that they served at oh lunch. Oh, my God. Kurt, you, you blew it. it. Kurt, you blew Feeling it. good today, aren't you? You blew it. It was good. Gu- and I'm a Louisiana boy, and it was good. It was a little thick. The roux was a little thick, but the flavor was delicious. It was. I had three three bowls of it. Three bowls. Oh, yeah. Man, it had so, okra in it, and I don't like okra. But, man, this – this was special, man. It was good. It was great. And we're also thankful that Kurt finally did something on this show and booked us a special guest today, <laughs> Gary Myers, author of the brand new book, How About Them Cowboys, Inside the Huddle with the Stars and Legends of America's Team. Welcome to the show, Gary. I am just honored to be among greatness here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What about me and Kurt? Yeah. No, no, Kurt. Well, I heard you guys are good children. I'm talking, <laughs> hey, I was there when Nate was a rookie. I forget what year it was. Yeah, 86. But we knew right away this what is, what is, svelte guy from <laughs> Florida was going to be a, a big-time player. I have heard a yeah. lot of yeah. words to describe you, but svelte has never been one. Never. And, he, and you know what? I would hope that, that Gary and really felt that way because when they looked at me and said, if the Cowboys leave this guy on the team, they are doomed. <laughs> <laughs> In all seriousness, Dropped your cookie. I, mean, I remember I, – I, I, like, I didn't remember what year it was, but I do remember out in Thousand Oaks, it didn't take long for us to realize – that th- this guy was was special. He yeah. had some USFL experience, right? right? Yes, sir. Oh. And I he needed it he, too. he stepped right in there. And um, was it Erkenbach? Was he the line coach? Yeah, there? he the one that uh, gave me my big chance because remember, Coach Myers liked the smaller guys. He right, liked the guys, you know, around two sixty five, two seventy. You know, which eliminated yeah. big <laughs> <laughs> name. So when Erkenbach, yeah, you got that right. Jim Erkenbach yeah. came in and said. Uh, he saw the new slogan, you know, we got Big Noon and we're going to bring the biggest wood possible. And don't take that the wrong way. <laughs> you, don't you take that. <laughs> yeah. But, man. Gary, tell us, yes. before we get into this, Nate yeah. doesn't like to talk about himself. Do you have any stories about Nate that you can tell us? Now, this is a PG show. Uh, Do you have any any stories that uh, you well, remember? Well, if we're going to keep it to PG, I've nope. got none. <laughs> he, he has none because he was one of the great uh, – he, he, he was a journalist. He was a columnist. He was everything that said journalism. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't going to do nothing wrong. Back in the day, they had they had that integrity. So they weren't going to hang out with us. You he, know, he was a professional. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I, t- I tell people, that, and this is really the truth, and I'm not just saying it because I just wrote a book about the Cowboys, and I'm not saying it because yeah. I'm sitting here. And I've been gone from Dallas for 29 years. The most fun and the best job I ever had was right here in Dallas with the morning news, covering the Cowboys from 81 to 89. Yeah. Right as that great newspaper war between the Morning News and the Times Herald had really hit its height, the Cowboys were the most important beat, not just in the sports section, but in the entire newspaper. We competed against other newspapers, against the TV stations, against the radio stations. Everybody was all in on covering the Cowboys. And it was energizing. And whatever I've accomplished in my career um, was because of being here in Dallas and using this not as a stepping stone because this is too big to be a stepping stone, but as a way to establish myself. And it was great. So I, that I, I knew eventually I wanted to write a book about the Cowboys. I wasn't sure when I was going to do it or what mm-hmm. it exactly was going to be about, but I, I just loved being here and I loved writing about the Cowboys. So that um, was that, my inspiration. I'm surprised to hear that in a little ways. Cause you, then you went to New York. Yeah. I was is, there at the daily news for 29 years. Yeah, and I would think that would be the energize I mean, and, you well, know, that was, that was invigorating. Talk about newspaper to, wars. Yeah. Oh. I mean, my hometown to be writing a column, a, a, a pro football column in the daily news for 29 years, the exposure that gave me and, wow. and, um, um, and, and, and circulating my name because of that. And then I worked for HBO and inside the NFL for 13 years. But I'm telling you, it was it was being here when I was 27 years old when I came here, so it was like three four years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, being here, trying to make a name for myself, 
and, and trying to do it the right way with a lot and establish my credibility and my integrity. And they will tell you. I mean, the, the players gravitated towards me yeah. because they knew I would tell their story. I was not a, I, I, I try to play it down the middle. I was not a management guy, and, and all the writers pr- prior to me in 81, the, in nothing, no disrespect, but the, the local papers, and this was yeah. before you got here, were like an extension of the Cowboys Weekly. Oh, yeah. And I just came here with a kind of a New York attitude. We're going to tell what's really going on behind the scenes. And the players liked that... Um, you know, if they, if they wanted to complain about their contracts or their playing time, you know, get in line in front of me. And <laughs> yeah, I, I'm happy yeah. to tell this. To, you know, it's funny. I did a thing the other night with Brad Sham and, uh, and Gil Brandt at a bookstore. And, I mean, Gil was just in the, in the, in the audience. And um, so they're asking me, you know, how, how did, you know, get guys like Nate and Everson and Thurman and Wall. I mean, and um, um, th- um who was my other good? Tony Hill, Drew yeah, Pearson, yeah. Cosby, all those guys. You know, how did you get them on your side? And I said, well, you know, I realized right away that the Cowboys underpaid their players. And everybody goes, oh. And I go, hey, Gil. And, you know, Gil was sitting in the back. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about the. Well, before we get into that, yeah. you're actually doing a, another book signing yeah, today, right? Yeah, it's 6 o'clock tonight. Um, you now, guys, I hope you'll stick around. And, and, Nate, if you want to come by and sign yeah. some books, too, I'd love to have you. Um yeah, Jason Witten is going to come and uh, and Everson. Witt, man, yeah, yeah. that's great. Witten and Everson will be yeah. over here at a Fans United store out here yeah, at the Star. So. Gonna be, they're going to be sitting down. Anybody wants me to sign it, I'm more than happy, but I know the people are going to be coming to see them and maybe some people who remember yeah. me from the years I spent in Dallas, the older folks, and yeah. then those who remember me from inside the NFL and, uh, and transplanted New Yorkers who read me over the years in New York. But I know... Witten and Walls are the attraction, and I'm okay yeah. with that as long as people buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> Did Rick I'm not proud in that regard. For Everson for the and, Hall of Fame. But I think, I think it's really a fun book. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to read any of it, but I, I kind of touch on all the eras mm-hmm. uh, of the Cowboys. and uh, I, I look at it like there's three distinct eras of the Cowboys. You had the Landry era. You had the Jimmy and Jerry era. And you have the Jerry without Jimmy era. Right, right. And, I kind of I don't I won't say I broke it up like that, but there are chapters that cover different time periods. What makes your book? Because I, I tell people I heard the other day you was you know on my local station, and uh, and I'm saying to myself at the same time as you your interview, like what makes people want to buy your book, and what is the difference in the reason they should buy your book over other cowboy books. Well, if I just want to say, well, the difference is that I wrote it. Right, right, right. That's a give me. (laughs) But realistically, um, I had great access to Jerry and his family. I spent uh, five hours total with Jerry over a a couple of sit-downs. And if you guys know Jerry, over five hours, I probably got in at least three or four questions. Right, right. (laughs) But I spent a lot of time with Stephen and Charlotte and Jerry Jr. separately and there's a lot in the book about the family interaction, how this really is a $5 billion mom-and-pop operation. I mean, this is really a family business. So I get into their relationships, and uh, I, I talk about Jerry as a general manager and, and why, and maybe that's his major failing. Right. Am I allowed to say that on the station? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he allows for, you know. Yeah, we're very yeah. unbiased. Here. Okay, good. Unbiased, but just good. don't go too deep because okay. I don't want him to look at me instead of you. <laughs> you know what's funny that you said that? Because I've, I've said it on the show when people ask me, how is it working for Jerry Jones and the Dallas Cowboys? And I said, it's really kind of funny, and unless you, you've been in this environment, you, don't, you can't appreciate it. It is a billion-dollar company. Five billion dollars. Well, multi-billion, yes. But <laughs> that is run like a mom-and-pop grocery store. You're, you're right down the hall from the family. They pass you in the hall. They say right. hi. They understand the work, the work, home life balance. They appreciate that. That encourage you to take off. They encourage you to take vacations. I, I'm so glad you said that because that's exactly like what yeah, it is. Yeah, and there really is a family atmosphere to this. In fact, um, Charlotte was telling me that they go on vacations as families. I don't know that I would want to do that, but other than with my kids <laughs> I, and my yeah, wife. Right. But um, and that more often than not, the family vacation turns into a boardroom meeting. Right, that right. Jerry and his kids, you know, they get together in a conference room at a hotel or just in the living room of where of their house or whatever, and and they start talking business. So they can't really, um, they don't want to escape each other, but they can't really escape the family business because it's it's, the it's their life. Thing. It's their biggest thing yeah. in their lives. But I also get into Jerry's relationship with Jimmy, and I think I add a, some new perspective there. And there's some really funny stuff about 
Jerry's four years with Bill Parcells. And, and Bill, during the time he was here and in the years after, has always said how much he enjoyed working with Jerry. And I think that's evident in some of the stories that I tell. And then, Nate, a, a chapter that you can really relate to, um, it was a little bit before you got there for the most part, mm -hmm. but um, I have a chapter on the dorm room in Thousand Oaks, everybody's favorite place to go. Yeah, man, wow. Uh, Ron Springs, <laughs> Robert Newhouse, Dennis Thurman, and Tony Dorsett sharing a dorm room together, and it was the center of the universe. And that's where everybody went to kill time and have fun. And relax. And how, how cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is only radio. Right? Yeah, yeah, nobody yeah. can see what Nate just did. Well, yeah. actually, no, actually, you can't. Did right there. Oh, yeah. then everybody saw what Nate just did. Yeah. 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 You know that. Um, it made me lose my train of thought. The norm. The center, no, no, no. center of attraction. Okay, okay. So these, these guys, uh, I was just kidding about losing my train of thought. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyhow, these guys were was tight, as tight as brothers. And. The idea was that they were going to grow old and their friendship was going to stay intact and they'd be right now in their mid to early to mid 60s and yes. along with Nathaniel here they'd be hanging on somebody's porch drinking a beer and telling Landry stories. Right. Sadly and unfortunately and tragically, you know, Ron Springs is gone, Newhouse is gone, Tony's having memory loss issues and Dennis Dennis is fine. Yeah. Thank goodness for that. But so I I tell the story about how these guys, you know, you, other than Newhouse, because he's a little older at the time, used to break curfew at night together and go to Los Angeles. Nate was from L.A. I mean, Nate Thurman, Nate Thurman they used to call yeah. uh, Dennis Thurman Nate until the real Nate came along. Um, <laughs> the real Nate, that's your new name, the real Nate. <laughs> um, so they used to bust curfew, and they'd come back at 3 o'clock in the morning, and Jim Myers had taken done bed check before they left, so... You know, they'd stick the pillows under the sheets in case he came back, but they got busted one night. And <laughs> like Escape from Alcatraz. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. Right? And they, they knew in order to lessen the fine, the, the deal was, and I didn't believe Dennis when he told me this, but he swore that if you went and knocked on Landry's door to apologize for breaking curfew, the fine got reduced. So if you can imagine these guys at three o'clock in the morning walking across that little street, remember yes, sir, man. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. And then Landry's room was in the back on the first floor, and you yeah, can imagine was. Tom coming out in his pajamas and his little beanie hat that he would sleep. <laughs> no, I don't know that he slept in that, but um, but if you can just imagine Tom in his pajamas coming to the door and Thurman standing in front of him and going. I'm sorry, Coach. Dennis, I'm really disappointed in you. Now, you go to sleep. And then the practice was 9 o'clock in the morning. Yes. <laughs> and so Newhouse would be standing with Jim Myers, the offensive line coach, laughing at Dorsett and Thurman and Springs, who were dragging at practice because they got maybe two and a half hours worth of sleep. And it, it was a ritual that, you know, Dennis knew L.A. They'd go to the Playboy Mansion. They'd go out to different clubs uh, just to escape Camp and thousand. I'm sure you went over the wall a few times. I, I, I tried once, <laughs> but when they told Ed, you know the Ed uh, Jones story. What know. about him trying to make like a tree? Or <laughs> yeah. <something>? What? <laughs> tell the Ed Jones. You tell, story. tell the story. Because um, I I heard bits and pieces of Ed. And like he said, Coach Jim Myers was the offensive line coach, but he was Coach Landry's right hand man. Right. And. He was not going to let you pull anything over on Coach Landry. So anything that he thought was of importance, like curfew, that was – oh, man, he'd come off the field, watch film, and he'd be waiting, watching the clock for curfew. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> they all go out, right, uh, Ed and his group. You know, they all go out, which was – Ed was part of the Thurmanism group. So they out doing their thing. <laughs> And they coming back, and just the, and I, I, maybe I'm wrong in what I'm saying, but they coming back, and all of a sudden, here come Coach Myers, you know, doubling back, and, and he see, he sees him right, so he he trying to see who it is, and Ed stands up, puts his hands up <laughs> to make like a tree. <laughs> that is a true story, and for those who are too young to remember. Ed was six foot nine, yeah. so if he puts his hands yeah, up in the air like, like this, like he he's seven like, foot four, he looks yeah, like a tree. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Did he get busted? He got, no, he got away with he it. He got away with it. <laughs> he got away with it. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the, in the area in front of the dorms, if I they remember correctly. had a bunch of trees. Yeah, and uh, it wasn't that well lit. No, it wasn't. You had stairs you had to go up, and it, <laughs> and it was lights in the inside that, you know, 
came through the little windows, but you couldn't really see because mm-hmm. they the lights were like soft glow. Yeah, the little, yeah. you know. So it was a dorm, beautiful dorm at that time. Yeah, it you was go a, back and look campus. at it now. I'll be like. Oh, we used to sleep in there. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, the Rams have, uh, the, their offices are at Cal Lutheran. Yeah, I know, I know. But training camp was, um, I, I really, I didn't like, I mean, I didn't have a family when I when I lived in Dallas. Mm. So it wasn't like I was leaving a wife and kids behind. And it became much harder when I moved to New York and I had to do it. And I had to leave my wife and kids behind. But I liked being there because it, is, it allowed me to establish relationships with these guys. And, you know, after two or three weeks, everybody would get kind of stir crazy. And yeah. there was really not a lot to do in Thousand Oaks. But you had to drive to L.A. It was all oh, the way. And then the ride back late at night, it yeah. was a killer. I mean, it was re- you wouldn't hit much traffic, but it was just a long ride. Yes. And it seemed endless. But anyhow, so I was to try to break the monotony. I, I, I would go to Hertz every week and I, they would call me in when they'd get a, new, a brand new car. I'm not really into cars, but it was just fun to drive it. It'd be out there for six weeks. It was fun to drive a different car every week. <laughs> wow, six weeks, Cam? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you- and you get to go home for the first preseason game. Yes, you did. And then go to San Diego oh, for the and, second. And four weeks kills us. I can't oh, imagine it was, it was horrible. <laughs> so anyhow, there was a Best Western Hotel on Moore Park Road. Right, right. And the, I got to know the woman there. And whenever they'd get a new fleet of cars in, and I was really into driving convertibles, and, and I lent my car to the players sometimes. And... So I went there one morning, like 8 o'clock, to get a car. Now, I'm not going to name names here because I didn't name yeah. it in the book. And I'm not even going to tell you on, off right. the air who this was. Right. But as I'm getting there, walking into the Best Western Hotel, a player is walking out at 8 o'clock <laughs> in the morning. Now, safe to say he just didn't go there for breakfast. Right. And was coming back <laughs> for practice. And he's running out looking all, all disheveled. And I don't want to even tell you if he was married right. or had right, a girlfriend right, right, because right. I don't want to give any hints. Yeah. Except he was married, um, <laughs> and, and he it was he saw me walking in, and he was walking out, and he goes, and I'm not even going to imitate his voice. I'm just going to say it in my voice. Right. He goes, Gary Myers, this is between us, <laughs> and I said, Yes, sir, but now I have one on you. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. he had to get in. You guys had to check in for breakfast. Or yeah, each of the yeah. meals they were, you had to eat breakfast. They, it was mandatory that you eat breakfast because our practice was was pretty hard, yeah. pretty brutal yeah. practice, and they didn't want guys out there getting sick or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that was another way to ensure that you were there. That you got that right. Yeah. That you came in for curfew. Yeah. Uh-huh. So th- this guy, you know, was. Like I said, really disheveled, his, his shirt hanging out of his pants. He didn't tie his shoes. He was running to his car because he knew he wanted to go home and shower and, and get dressed for, go for breakfast and get dressed for practice. And it was 9 o'clock in the morning. For, it was just, it was really I funny. Mean, you wanted to break the monotony with, with cars. He just wanted to break the monotony with mattresses. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. Mattress. I, couldn't, I couldn't blame him because I, I know how the mattress, I stayed in, stayed in the dorm for the first few years yeah. until I finally talked to my sports editor, Dave Smith. I said, man. You can't make me stay in this dorm anymore. The paper's making money. Let me stay in the house. So I actually rented a house for six weeks. And it wasn't Nate, but I will tell you this. There's another kind of -of out-of-school story. I didn't use this in the book. Um, There was a player who knew I had a house, okay? Mm -hmm. And this was the weekend trip to San Diego. So the players, I think he used to... Bus it to L.A. Yeah. and fly to San Diego because the traffic was horrible. But all the riders, because it was a night game, we had to stay over. It was too far to drive back from San Diego to Thousand Oaks at night. So one of the players who I was friendly with, again, nameless player, and it was a long time ago, so it doesn't matter anymore. But, um, hey, man, you're not coming back tonight, are you? No, I'm not coming back. <laughs> you got an extra set of keys to the house? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said... I don't want to know anything, but here are the keys. Just make sure you lock the door in the morning, and you better be out of there by the time I come back. Right. So, listen, I, I felt I felt bad for the players because, I mean, these, these guys, and even guys who weren't, you know, as big as Nate, even like the wide receivers like Doug Donnelly or Drew Pearson who were, you know, under 200 pounds, Dorsett was 190 pounds. But to make them sleep on these mattresses, and I don't even think they brought in mattresses that was special for you guys no, for the summer. No. Maybe some guys would bring their own, and yeah. they'd, you'd see them bringing in TVs and stuff like that. But I was uncomfortable sleeping on those mattresses, and I didn't go through two-day practices with right. every, you know, 
being fatigued and every bone hurting or whatever because you guys hit a lot in practice in yeah, those days. Well, you did. And Ooh. so I didn't blame them if they just wanted to go to. The, I'm sure the player who used my house that night just wanted to get a good night's oh, sleep. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Break that right? match. Would you agree with that, Nate? <laughs> Kurt, and, being the editor, <laughs> we'll let you have the last question. The last question? Well, I have a lot of questions for Gary. Well, you should have asked them sooner well, because yeah, I, no, I talked too long. No, I'm no, sorry. no. I just, well, I have a, I have a couple. And okay, you, you, can can you can do two. You can do two. One is just, I mean, you were here in that transition from Landry yeah. to Jimmy. How did that and Jerry, how did that whole thing go for you? I mean, was it it sounded like it was a pretty wild time of people yeah, coming it, and going. Yeah, it was. In fact, when the story broke, I was in Las Vegas because I was supposed to be covering a Mike Tyson fight. And um, we had no idea what was going on. A quick story about this. A guy, I don't know if you remember Tom Murray. What well, not Scott Murray, but Tom Murray. No, he worked no. for Channel 5. He had a friend who was handling the sale at the investment firm that was handling the uh, bum bright sell to whoever was going to buy the team. And the guy tipped him off. This is the story that I heard, yeah. that Jerry was buying the team and he was hiring Jimmy as the coach. And he did his report breaking the story from the University of Miami campus. He was so far ahead of everybody on that story. He flew to Miami and did the report from the campus. He called text for comment. Tex didn't know anything about it because Tex was, anytime a, a buyer came in and was indicating that he was going to either get rid of Tom or, or Tex or both. Tex would never tell Bum that this guy was interested in buying the team. He would rip it up and put the application in the garbage can. <laughs> so Bum finally got wise to it. And so, you know, why is not not any, any legitimate bids? It's because Tex was, you know, putting in the paper shredder. Yeah. So when this guy, Tom Murray, called Tex to get comment, Jerry's buying the team, he's firing Tom, and Jimmy's going to be the coach. Tex goes in that gravelly voice, young man, you are committing career suicide if you go that go with that story. Tex didn't know anything about it. And when we called him that night, he didn't know anything about it. I flew back from Vegas that morning because I knew it had to be true. Mm -hmm. And wow. then, you know, it, it got done over the next uh, 36 hours. And then the, the Saturday Night Massacre press conference at Valley Ranch on February 25th, 1989, never forget that date, um, Jerry and Tex flew down on Jerry's plane. Uh, Tom was playing golf with Tom Jr. Pulled them off the golf course into the clubhouse or the dining room there and said, basically, uh, I'm here and so is Jimmy and nothing personal. He really did like Tom. Uh, but, you know, a guy was spending every penny he had. He wanted his own guy in there. And right. I think Tom understood. It just wasn't, it wasn't handled properly. But um, to make a long story short here, the next morning... The race was on to find Tom because, you know, he was down in Austin. I first went, he flew his own plane. So I went to the airport in Addison looking for him. I went to his house to look for him and no sign of Tom. We drove out to Valley Ranch in those days, unlike having security right. guards every 10 feet in this building. Um, <laughs> we, the riders had our own uh, car. car uh, yeah. The key, the, yeah, the, the code. Key. Yeah. Herschel Walker. Roger Staubach, 3412. Right. That's how we got that it. Was the, that, was the, that was the thing. Yeah, he right. right. He correct. Right. And we walked right in. Uh, David Moore, who was then with the Star Telegram, now at the Morning News, uh, I ran into him at Landry's house, and we, went, we decided to drive out to Valley Ranch, thinking maybe we'd luck out. Tom's car was in his parking spot. We used the 3412 to get in the building, which not only got you in the building, got you in the locker room, got you in the coach's office. We had free run in the place. We walked back wow. there. Tom's sitting in his office. Barbara Goodman who was one of my book signings the other night. I hadn't seen her in 30 years. And Tell me good. Wow, oh, man, she, I haven't she, seen she's her wonderful. Forever, man. She looked great. So she's sitting wow. in front there and said, sorry, but Mr. Landry is busy. He hears our voice. He goes, no, Barbara, it's okay. They can come in. So we sat in the office as Tom packed his belongings wow. into boxes. And you're thinking, this is like any person in America who just got, lost their job. And he's going, if I knew I had this much stuff, I would have cleaned out my desk a lot earlier. <laughs> I mean, it was really compelling. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm sitting in on NFL history here. Yeah. This is one of the most famous people in the long history of the NFL who just got fired. And just like any Joe Smith or whatever, uh, is sitting there with these cardboard boxes, packing up 29 years of memories. And Tom was gracious. There was no sign of bitterness when we talked to him. It was probably the most compelling scene I've ever been a part of in 40 years of writing about the NFL. Well, I wish it, you would have had. I wish these would have been. Wow. Oh, yeah. God. But you know, you know what, Nate? Here's the thing. It was almost better 
yes. that there wasn't this instantaneous need right. to tweet it or write a quick right. story for the paper. We sat with Tom for like an hour and a half and I had a, had a lot of tape to transcribe because transcribe I wanted to get mm. the story 100% right. right. And I had like a, a 7, 30 or 8 o'clock deadline, so I was able to take my time and carefully write the story. I can only imagine if that would happen today. Yeah. First of all, we'd never be able to get into the yeah. building with 3412 anymore. Right. <laughs> but, but, you know, you'd feel like after you sat with him for 15 minutes, I got to get the heck out of there and go write the story. I just sat in with Tom Landry as he's packing up his office. So at least the one good thing in those days was – there wasn't this need to get your Hurry story up written. And get it right. yeah. yeah, and I was able to Hurry spend really quality wrong. time with him. Right. So that that is a, like a lasting memory that I'll I've had about my career because I really like Tom a lot. Who and didn't? Man. Yeah, I mean he was who great. didn't? He he just treated with the respect. There was no such thing as a stupid question, although God knows I asked plenty of stupid questions, and um, and he was so gracious. On can you can you hang out a little bit longer? Are you on a deadline? Are you on a schedule? No, if you need me, I'll stay. Stay for another segment because I know Kurt's got a few more well, questions. Sure. I'd love to, and and we'll we'll keep you for another. Unless 10 Kurt wants me to so. leave. No, 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 not at all. You sure, not at all. all no, right. these are great. Yeah, hang hang around because okay. this is this is great for the fans. This is pulling the curtain back. So, uh, hang in there. We'll take a quick break and we'll come right back on hanging with the boys. A man's Stetson doesn't just protect him from life's elements. It projects an unstoppable and legendary spirit, just like the men wearing silver and navy on the field every Sunday. Since 1865, Stetson hats are American made with pride right here in Texas. They are still the official crown of all self-respecting cowboys. And Stetson is proud to be on the field with America's team. Find Stetson hats in the pro shop or at Stetson.com today. Want to use what the pros use? How about the official men's skincare brand of the Dallas Cowboys, Jack Black? Right now, you can get the Jack Black Playmaker, a curated collection of Cowboys locker room favorites for just 10 bucks with free shipping. The Playmaker includes four Jack Black skincare favorites plus a full-sized intense therapy lip balm and a Cowboys can cooler. Go to getjackblack.com slash cowboys and use the code word COWBOYS. The Jack Black Playmaker, 10 bucks, free shipping. Star Sports Tours is the only official fan travel partner of the Dallas Cowboys, offering exclusive game weekend travel packages with sideline access and photo ops with current players, alumni, and cheerleaders. That's not all, though. You'll get to talk X's and O's with Senior Director of Player Personnel, Will McClay, and, of course, with yours truly, me, Brian Broadus. You can trust the official fan travel partner of the Dallas Cowboys, and with us, you'll travel like a pro. Visit CowboysTravel.com to book your travel package today. While a player could look good on paper, it's when he's out on the field that you really find out what he's made of. That's why the Cowboys rely on more than just stats and scouting reports when building their team. When picking a tractor, it's why you should rely on more than just specs and features. You've got to take it out and put it to the test. The Cowboys did when they named John Deere their official tractor. Experience one for yourself. Visit myjohndeardealer.com slash football. Back to Hanging with the Boys. Hello. There Hello. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, Douglas. Appreciate <laughs> it. We're back. Back. The star in Frisco. Special guest, Gary Myers. And even more special guest, Kurt Daniels. Has yes. to... Tell you about his balls. So happy that in front of this esteemed guest, I have to talk about underwear here. True Cowboy loves his freedom, and Tommy John gives you that feeling of freedom where it counts with a contour pouch pouch that nestles you in fabrics you can barely feel. Shop exclusive Cowboys underwear, tommyjohn.com forward slash cowboys for 20% off your first order. tommyjohn.com forward slash cowboys. Freedom! There you go. Yes. Is that my gift for being on the show? <laughs> <laughs> you get to hang out with Nate for 30 minutes. That's your gift. Hey, hey. So, we ain't, without further ado, let's go, man. Yeah. This, it'd be like, like, just wow. in case you're catching up, yeah. you're just catching up. We're with Gary Myers. He has a brand new book out called How About Them Cowboys Inside the Huddle with the stars and legends of America's team. And he will be out here at the Fans United store at the Star this afternoon with Jason Witten and Everson, Everson Walls. Walls. Everson Walls. Six o'clock? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. So, Kurt? That's a cool event. It That'd is a cool, cool event. Take it away. Yeah. Take it well, we've kind of hinted at it a couple of times, but in your long career, how much... Have you seen the media change, and has that been better or worse for now? It's, uh, I, it's much before worse. You answer, yeah. Before you answer, let me say this right here. I, I thank guys for him, 
Brad, Coll- uh, Tim Collishaw, uh, yeah. Galloway, uh, Black and Sherrod. The- and the reason I appreciate y'all, because whenever you all came up to us, on, they, w- they would not really ask a question. They would be like, okay, what do you think about this? Because they had already done the research. Mm-hmm. So when they asked you a question, it, it, you couldn't back out of it. You just had to give your side right. of it. And, and that, that's the difference for me. Yeah. So they don't they don't make them like guys. They don't make guys like Nate anymore. And I mean that with a great deal of respect. That um, back in those days, guys were honest with you. They weren't hanging out in the training room trying to avoid you when you walked in the locker room. Uh, if they didn't want to answer a question, they would just say, "Hey, man, you know I can't answer that question. That's too sensitive." Or they would just talk, talk, talk about it off the record. Now. These guys now, they're making too much money. So I, I think it would happen. <laughs> is, no, let me, yeah. let, me, let me explain yeah. this to you. I think the whole relationship between players and the media changed when the players started making what they deserved. Now, what I mean by that is like in the 80s, before free agency came about, it was really important for these guys to present a positive image so that Nate can go get a, an endorsement deal with a car company or, or Danny White can go pitch right. whatever. And the way they presented a positive image was through us. So they wanted to cooperate. Am I right about that? That's right. Okay. That is right. So then once they started, when I say too much money, I'm just saying when they start making more money, and they, they deserve every penny they get. It's short careers. They're putting their bodies on the line every week. But instead of making $200,000 a year as a base salary, if they're making $3 million a year, then getting that $50,000 endorsement deal where it used to be an additional 25% of their salary – now it just pays for a long weekend in Las Vegas. So it's not as important to them anymore. So they, it's, they don't think twice about blowing you off when you want to sit down and do a long interview with them. And they don't need the media as much. Now they have Twitter. They get their own points of view across. They can do the Players Tribune, Instagram stories, Facebook, you name it, have their own podcast. We used to be the intermediary between the team and the public. But they've basically gotten rid of the middleman by controlling the message themselves. And... Um, that has led to, I don't think the writing is as good today because there's not the insight that you need from the players because they don't want to cooperate as much. Um, the whole game now is not to be right, it's to be first. And if you're wrong, people forget about it. If you're right, you know, people say, oh, you know, this guy had it first. But if you're wrong, it takes about two, three minutes and people forget you were wrong. Yeah. Um, and it's just the immediacy of the business has changed the standards of the business. And people just aren't as concerned anymore about their integrity and their credibility because it's more important to try to be recognized as the one who breaks the story. Wow. And, I'm, and I'm serious. I, you know, a couple of times they, they came to me like, but Nate, what do you think? Because I, so I've been on did something while. What are you? And I couldn't even refute it because they done been a guy. They, they, they had sources and they'd and they be working and they have to have them. You know, and, and nowadays... Like he said, it was almost uh, to the point where people would sue you if you did it wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and so the newspaper had to put you on the front page. And I, now they put you in the back. Hey, yeah, man, we got it wrong. Hey, but you got to go right. to, you know. <laughs> Nobody cares because, like I say, these phones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Get it? You know, it's, everybody's It's reporting. really become, I mean, maybe not so much with sports as other aspects. We don't have to get into right. that. but. It's really the media, though there's still really good journalists around, the ones who really care. But there's too many who don't care enough yes. and they're very careless. And it's just the standards aren't the same. So that's my best way of describing how the media has changed in all the years I've been in it. When I had a big story at the morning news, I had to go through layers of people to make sure we would run it. And if it had any legal aspect to it, they had to call the lawyers into it. But, um, now, a lot of writers can just file their stories themselves on their websites without anybody reading it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it can be dangerous. Yeah. What's your, sure. when we go, go back to the book a little bit, mm-hmm. what's your favorite story in the book that you can pull the curtain back a little bit for people that kind of want to know what, a little bit more about what the book's about? Yeah. Um, I think that the anecdote that I have in there that probably sums up the last 25 years of the Cowboys, is we all know when Jimmy left how upset Troy was. Troy was a big Jimmy guy, um, hated Switzer, back to the days of Oklahoma Mm -hmm. when Troy broke his leg and he comes back and they changed the offense and he transferred to UCLA. 
So then Barry becomes the, the coach of the team, and Troy's thinking of anybody but Switzer, right? So he's really kind of bitter about that because he liked the discipline of, of Jimmy and, and really felt because that team was so young and so good. What was your last year? Uh, my last year was 98, 90, 97, 98. Okay, so you yeah. lived through all this. Right. And Troy was just really upset because he felt this team was capable of winning four or five in a row. And so he's sitting with, with Jimmy – probably like in the last five years or whatever, a lot of years had passed, and they're sitting having a beer together, and Troy looks at him, and he says, you know, we could have been Brady and Belichick. Mm, wow. And that they would have been Brady and Belichick before Brady and Belichick were Brady and Belichick. And he's right, because when you think about it, Cowboys win in 92 and 93 despite Switzer. They get to the NFC Championship game the next year, would have won that game with Jimmy because he never would have fell behind. I think it was 21 nothing in the first quarter or something like that, and nearly came back to win the game. And then next, and the 49ers killed the Chargers in the Super Bowl, so you know the Cowboys would have done the same. And then the next year, the Cowboys beat the Steelers. So that would have been four in a row. Even though free agency had hit, as good a coach as Jimmy was, he was even better with the personnel. Yes, so he, he would have replenished the personnel as they were losing the Alvin Harpers. The and Nate Newtons. He... he you wasn't going to last long. I agree. Go ahead on, sir. I'm okay, sorry. No, so that, I, I, no all, all I'm yeah. saying is that, so Troy, I don't think to this day, has gotten over Jimmy leaving because of what they could have accomplished together. And Troy wasn't a me guy. You know that. I mean, he was all about the team. And he's just thinking, this is the team that could have been considered the greatest in NFL history because they were young and they were talented and they had a great coach who was a great personnel guy. They had an owner who wasn't afraid to spend money. They had tremendous fan support, and they had it cooking. And what they lost after Jimmy left was the discipline that's necessary to sustain it, and they lost the personnel guy who was necessary to sustain it as free agency hit. So whereas Troy, I think people would agree, Troy is not as good a quarterback as Tom Brady, but Troy was perfect for that Cowboy team because he had, he had Michael and he had Emmett. And he had other weapons, and he had a great offensive line. You know, and by this guy, and you could have won a bunch more. Let me say, is that how you felt? Oh, uh, this I feel is he was wrong on the Tom Brady Troy Aikman deal. Because uh, Troy, with Troy, uh, maybe I don't know. By even about the intellect part, I want to give Brady a lot of it, but arm talent, man. Oh on. no, Troy is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm talking about arm talent. You know, yeah, and so. I think Jimmy would have – because Jimmy, he was a little ahead of his time because he could see when a player was declining. And he would, you know, he would be like, hey, man, it's nothing personal, but you got to go. And he, he was good at that. And, uh, man, yeah, I, I agree with you, man. I mean, but Tom Brady is – he the man. You know, and he maybe Troy would have been thought about, like he said, we could have been Brady and Belichick. If Troy had won four in a row, mm-hmm. now he never had the numbers – that these quarterbacks of today have oh, because no. the game has changed. Right, right. right. Yeah. And he also had – Brady's never had a great receiver and a great running back at the same time. Mm-hmm. In fact, he's never really had a, a great running back. And his best receiver was Randy Moss, and he only had him for a few years. Mm-hmm. And now Gronk. So uh, Troy was surrounded by more talent, which led to a more balanced offense. The Cowboys' f- offensive line those days was much better than any offensive line that Brady's had. But – Troy might have, you know, if Troy won four or five in a row or just four or five total, he might have been considered, despite the numbers not being there, he might have been considered the greatest quarterback of all time. Because he's right. I mean, nobody could throw it like Troy. I'm telling you, his arm talent was – this is – Gary, this is what makes it so special, man, is the fact that you were right, man. As soon as uh, Jimmy left, it took like a year. And the discipline, because I I noticed it, because I won the wild guy. So – it was to – at that time, I thought it was to my favorite. As you look back, you wish you would have stayed more disciplined yeah. because he would tell you, Troy would come in a room. You know, Troy could just walk through – he could be out there laughing. But if he was walking into a football atmosphere, his whole demeanor. Yeah. He he becomes straight, nothing but football. That's how Brady is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He would he, – he, boy. Yeah, yeah, and you know, um, so Jimmy's reaction when – when Troy said to him, we could have been Brady and Belichick, was because Jimmy told me the story. Mm. And I said, well, what did you say when he said that? You know, he's right. And he goes, I wasn't phased by it. He goes, the most important thing in my life is to be happy. <coughs> and I just wasn't happy. When I talked to Jerry about it, he, he admitted he's still bitter about the way it ended. You know, uh, 
Jimmy saying that he, yeah. he Jacksonville was an appealing situation and then yeah. a bunch of other things that happened. But he did admit to me that he wished in those days he was more patient and said that he's always been able to handle failure better than success. And when the Cowboys were one in fifteen in, in eighty nine, as you remember, right, yeah. you know well, and then got a little better in the second year and the playoffs the third year, Jerry said they handled the first couple of years together much better than when they won. Well, why? Because they were losing, and everybody's saying Jerry doesn't know what the heck he's doing, and Jimmy's a college coach, so the criticism bonded them. To it. we'll show them, yeah, but then nice when story. they started winning, and everybody's saying, "Well, Jimmy made the Herschel Walker trade. Jimmy traded up for Emmitt Smith. Jimmy did this, and Jimmy did that." What did Jerry do? Jerry turned around a team that was losing a million dollars a month, and has turned it into a very profitable enterprise. That wasn't enough for Jerry. He wanted to be known as a football man, so there wasn't enough credit to go around. And then when he wanted more credit, Jimmy started resenting him, and it got to the point where they no, couldn't. no, he didn't resent him. He didn't let him in. Right. Okay. He didn't let him that's in. A be, that's a much better yeah. way of saying it. He didn't let him in. You're I, right. I remember that. I remember some functions I was at, and they would bring up Mr. Jones, and Jimmy just would not let him in. He would just not let him in. See, you know, Mr. Jones don't want all the credit, but he do want to be yeah. let in. Yeah. Speaking, yeah. Of, speaking of letting in, do you think Jimmy will ever be in the Ring of Honor? Yeah. You know, I'll answer that one time. I just want to tell you one thing that Michael told me, yeah. Irvin told me. He said – I just wish that Jimmy would have let Jerry play with his toy just a little bit more. <laughs> That's for real, man. Let him in, man. I mean, he he. It's no amount of money J J Jerry, Mr. Jones, when it gave him. Right, just I agree let him with that. in, bro. As far as the Ring of Honor, it's pretty petty, I think, that Jimmy's not in the Ring of Honor because his contribution here over five years was tremendous. Just think about it. He won as many Super Bowls in five years as Landry did in 29. Um, but my theory on it is by Jerry letting Jimmy in, it validates Jimmy's contributions here, and Jerry's <clears throat> just not ready to do that because he's still bitter about it. I, I just don't think it phases Jimmy anymore. If you ask him, what about the Ring of Honor? You know how he'd say, ah, I, don't, I don't care about that. Just give me my Heineken and nachos. You know, he, he, does, he doesn't <laughs> yeah, care. Make sure my hair is straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Right? Um, so he doesn't care about that. But I think eventually he just has, he has to let him in. You know, I want to tell you one other thing. One of the best anecdotes I have in the book is how Landry got in the, in the Ring of Honor. You know, uh, Jerry really liked Landry. And it was Landry's accomplishments that led him to buying the team. I mean, that's, that Landry helped make an America's team. But Tom kept turning him down year after year because Tom was still very upset about the way he was let go. So there's a guy named Bill Parker who is the president of the Kroger supermarket chain in the Dallas area. And uh, that was a mutual friend. Tom was very close to him and Jerry was very close to him. Jerry claims there were billboards around Dallas in 1993 that was making fun of Landry for not accepting Jerry's invitation into the ring. I don't know if that's true because I was mm, back in right. New York at that point. So he asked Bill Parker to set up a meeting with Landry, and Landry accepted. They had a two-hour luncheon at Bill Parker's house. And, I, and at the end of the meeting, Tom had agreed to go in the ring honor. And I said to Jerry, uh, I never heard that story. He goes, I never told anybody but my family. And I said, well, now you've told, hopefully, a couple hundred thousand people who will buy my book. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I'm tell you, it just, you know, if you hear his stories and, you know, this is what's amazing to me. And, and so powerful men, when they ego, when they ego come in place, and, and, and that is what made Coach Johnson – the great coach that he was, and that was made Mr. Jones, the great man that he is. Because once they make up in their mind that they are right, it ain't no turning them back, man. But it also works to, their, de to their detriment because that's what I'm saying. That's they're what... so stubborn that they, the ego that got them to where they are, yeah. it also prevents them from maybe seeing things clearly and making good long-range decisions, even though it, it hurts them a little bit ego-wise. If Jerry had just taken a step back, he, he could have realized, okay, Jimmy's not letting me in. It really ticks me off, but we just won two Super Bowls. Let's ride this out as far as I can. We know Jimmy's not here long term. Right, right. And then when he leaves, you know, the next, yeah. I, won't, I won't hire the next coach who shuts me out. 
Right. But that's a really hard thing for a guy who who invested every penny he had, yeah. and then have a guy Socks he hired, a guy he hires, basically saying, "No, you stick to your to what you do, and let me do what I do." That's that's a hard thing to do. Yeah, because he he said coming in, I remember Jones say, "You know, y'all may not, you know, he told me y'all may not feel comfortable, but I'm here." From the socks to the that's jocks. Right, socks and, 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 that's and, and, right. And I, I just laugh because he's like, and and, and 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 you may remember this. He said, and uh, I have text, text Shram right here behind me. Yeah. And the way he put his hand up, yeah. I said, must have text won't be here long. Yeah, text, uh, text, yeah. text did not have a C. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, oh. He, see the pictures, text is just scowling. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. He, he, did, he, he didn't have a place to sit at right. the press conference. Oh, I'm telling you, Mr. <laughs> well, Jones. Is 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 more uh, deceptive than you think. <laughs> you know, what the, I'll tell you one last funny thing because you guys probably got to yeah. go to a break. So the next that weekend, so that weekend, yeah, do you remember the the mini camp? The off season program started. Yeah, yeah. Right, I think it was like two days the, later. The first real OTAs. Right. Yeah. So, so Tom has his goodbye press conference. Yes. and he Says, ah, oh, in two weeks you guys will forget about me, Jeff Roar. Who was so much smarter than he was a player? <laughs> yes, he <laughs> was. He was a good yeah. player. Yeah. He was a much smarter guy than he was a good football player. Great guy. He's walking around the locker room singing the Beverly Hill Hillbillies uh, theme song because everybody thought Jed Clampett had just bought team. Yeah, the team. <laughs> yeah. Which, what happened is that J.R. Ewing bought the team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have uh, to admit, I used that line in the book. <laughs> yeah, and I heard you say it on the radio the other day. Too. <laughs> I knew where you was going. I like, I like that yeah. line, so I've been repeating it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you though, this is what 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 amazes me about this whole thing is, and I'll keep saying it is. These dudes were so powerful in their own right. Yeah. And, and, and they just could not get past their power. They what, just couldn't get past But Jeff Raw got cut pretty quick after yeah. that, by yeah. the way. <laughs> it wasn't, it's kind of, Jerry's always taking criticism, criticism for this, but wasn't Landry, they were going to get rid of him anyway, weren't they? Well, you know, here, here's the thing I love living in Dallas, and I think the Cowboy fans are great, but they're so hypocritical. Yes, they are. 1998, people are calling Brad Sham's show. Every night, fire. why won't Tex fire him? Yeah, oh. The team is on the way to being 313, 313. We need a new coach. Why won't Tex do it? Tex didn't, he wanted Tom to retire. Mm. He had actually tried to hire Jimmy as the defensive coordinator and said, you're my coach in waiting. He tried that with Paul Hackett in 86, and it didn't work. But that Land blew up bad. Landry yeah. hated Hackett. Yeah, that blew up so, bad. And, and Jimmy wasn't leaving a program that was a powerhouse at, at Miami to come be a defensive coordinator with the promise you'll be a head coach. When he, he was going to leave Miami, he was going to go be a head coach in the NFL. So anyhow, all, all the fans wanted Landry gone. I remember it, man. Right? Wow. And so... Six weeks after the 88 season ends, and Tom is praying that Landry would retire, and Tom comes out and says, I can't leave the team like this. If it takes two or three years, I'm going to fix it. And Shram's going, oh, my God. You know, it's not <laughs> what he wanted. So yeah. Jerry comes in and buys the team and does what every fan wanted to be done. They wanted Landry fired. They would have rather he'd retired, but they wanted him gone. So he did what... I'd say 85% of the fans wanted, but because it was an outsider, because it was a guy from Arkansas they never heard of, it, all of a sudden, Jerry was the devil, and Tom became a martyr. It, I still contend to the day he passed away, and that was more than 10 years later, that the best thing that ever happened to Landry is that he got fired the way he did because people didn't remember 3-13, and 13, they didn't remember how the team fell apart during the strike year, they remembered... He became a sympathetic figure. The same people who wanted him fired were among the 100,000 people a month later who showed up at the same hats off to Landry Parade. Same people that hated Tony Romo for, five, for eight years. The same people that, this was easy, the same people that hated Tony Romo now that want Tony Romo back. Exactly. <laughs> Let me say this right quick, like, because yeah. you, you were here. And this, this blew me away. And this is why I have, uh, this is one of the many reasons I have respect for Mr. Jones. How bad was our city? Economically. Oh, it was, it was, it was. That, that's why Bumbright had to sell the team is because brother, his, it was bad. The, his banking business was. I don't remember the percentage of the team that was already in foreclosure that Jerry had to buy back from the courthouse, and that if he didn't buy it quickly, there was another percentage that was going to go in foreclosure. Uh, it, it was really bad. Jerry describes it like a bomb went off in Dallas that. Um, 
the, the real estate market was had gone in the toilet. The banking Ooh. industry was terrible. And so Jerry Man. cobbled together every penny he can get, spent $154 million on the team. And, you know, it's worth $5 billion now, so it was a good investment. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, they did a show, at ESPN or somebody yeah. did a show. And I was living in that time. I was young, you know, getting paid. And every, but when they started showing how bad Dallas as a whole yeah. economically was, I remember, I'm like, well, we were in bad shape. And I remember they was talking about how the team was in bad and I'm and I'm I'm a fan. I'm like, the Dallas Cowboys? Mm-hmm. The Dallas Cowboys? Yeah, you know, because as far as the, like the financial situation of the team itself, Bright had nothing to do with the running of the team. Right. And Tex ran out like he was the owner, but it wasn't his money. So he was never concerned about the bottom line. Everything was first class for the Cowboys. Mm-hmm. You know, the price be damned. And then so Jerry comes in. Like I said, it was losing a million dollars a month. When, when you think about it, the team was losing $300,000 a day. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. And he had to figure <laughs> out how to make this work really quickly. Yeah. While still staying a first class organization. Right. right. So that, that, that was the perception that we had. You know, that – if if we had free agency back then, we would have got all the top free agents. Now they weren't gonna get paid, but, they, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but we can. You know, I hope the, we gotta go. I hope this is my success. We gotta go because we got the players too. Yeah, we gotta go. Yeah, that, you wanna know how great this was? We just blew off our entire the second ship. break. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We blew off the whole it, show, it, the rest of the show. Do we just cost Jerry money? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> what, 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 what was he going to talk about so you can do a quick hit? Oh. So what was going to tell them? talk about it tomorrow. Yeah, no, we'll no, talk I'm talking about, about the, 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 the uh, sponsor. Don't we have a sponsor? Quickly. Oh, we could read a. We yeah, can, quickly, man. We quickly, can read yeah. a. If I can find. No, we threw it away. Oh, we don't have okay. it. Okay. What is good. Eat at the restaurants. Here, here Kurt, read, another, read no, another underwear no. ad. Go to, go to uh-huh. the pro shop today at six. <laughs> yeah. 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 I hope Let's, everybody comes up. Nate, I hope you. I don't know how long you're going to be in the building, but. Man, I'll be busy, but, but I'm going to tell you something. That's why when he came back the second segment, because we're just going to use you one, but he can't. That's I'm, so, I'm all in because some of the stories I'm going to bring back uh, tomorrow. You know, good. some of the stories you didn't tell and stuff like Because. Uh, when you look at Mr. Jones, you look at uh, Jimmy, and I'm glad you were able to turn back the time and give people true stories. You know, pieces of stories aren't, yeah. aren't good. It, it, it leaves people bitter, you know. But when the truth comes out, you may not like it, but at least you're like, okay, I can get past yeah. that. Yeah. Kurt, doesn't this make you want to do a better job every week? See how good this show was? If we could have <laughs> one good show a week by you just requesting a guest. No, it was, it was great you know what I hope this show did? What's I hope that? it makes people want to buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> makes me want to buy it. Hell. Yeah, wow. Man, this was awesome, Gary. Thank you so Thank much you for stopping well, Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah. I really enjoyed Kurt, it. Kurt, thanks for showing thanks, up. Sir. Yep, Nate, thanks Nate. for bringing it. <laughs> Thank you. Douglas, Thank you, is, is, this, is this a ritual? <laughs> thanks for doing what you're doing. Kent, yeah. thanks for pushing yeah. the buttons. Air yeah. fist bump, Gary. Yeah. Uh, Presley, thanks for helping out. We will, we're will. we going to get some players. Yes. Chris Jones canceled on us. He's got something going on, but we will have Brett Maher. We get to know the kicker. Right. Don't know a whole lot about him. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, dedica- I'm dedicated to the last to kicker still. So are you? Okay. Well, you can tell him that whenever we're going. Yeah, unless you want to pay me. <laughs> okay. We'll see. We'll work on that. All right, guys. Thanks for hanging for tuning in with Hanging with the Boys. <laughs> this has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys?